Ophel also. All right, how's everyone this morning? Good morning, I'm over here. <laughs> Welcome to the house this morning. If you're in person or online, we just wanna make you feel welcome. Let's just take a second, can you stand up, look around you, see if there's someone you don't know, okay? And just go introduce yourself, get to know their name a bit. and generations falling down and worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb 
And all who've gone before us And all who will believe We'll sing the song of ages to land. You guys remember that? Let's sing that again. A thousand generations. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe We'll sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. And all thrones and dominions, all power and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, And if you've been forgiven, and if you are redeemed, and sing the song forever to the Lamb. Yeah. And if you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name, you sing the song forever to the Lamb. Oh, I We'll sing a song forever and in man. Your name, your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. Yeah, yeah. And all thrones and dominions, all power and possessions your name stands above the all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy 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 to the King of Kings, holy you will always be, holy, holy forever, you will always be. darkness my God that is who you are you are you are 
We make a miracle work, a promise keep a light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you're touching every heart. I worship you, yeah, Lord, I worship you. You are here, oh, yeah. Healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. And you're mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you, oh, you are we make a make a work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, you are, you are, you are, we make a make a work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 And even when, even when, even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a make a work, a promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. One more time, we make a we make a miracle work, a promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, and that is who you are, that is, it is, it is, that is who you are, and that is who you are. And that is who you are. That is who you are. Thank you, God. That is who you are. That is who you are. God, thank you so much. God, I just want to thank you for your presence, for your power, God. God, uh, I thank you for all the little ways that you remind us how big you are and how in control you are and how small we really are. And Father, I just pray this morning that you would just fall fresh into our minds and into our awareness, I guess. Just help us to see you in a new light this morning. I pray that you'd help us to come with expectation God, with hope, God, with faith, and I just pray that you would pour your spirit out on this place this morning in Jesus' name, and I thank you, God. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me you are pleased and that I never alone your good good father who you are is who you are is who you are I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am. And I 
seen many searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word the good, good Father is who you are, is who you are, is who you are, and I'm loved by you, is who I am, is who I am, is who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Mm, yeah, you, you are perfect, perfect in all of your ways to us. Let's sing that again. You are perfect. You are perfect, perfect in all of your ways. ways. You are perfect, perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us love love so undeniable that I can hardly speak a peace so unexplainable that I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still into love. 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 Your good, good Father is who you are. Is who you are. Is who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. 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 Sing it again. You're a good, good father. Who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. But I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Of you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, yeah. All my life you have been so, so good. With every and breath that I am made for, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You will wear me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God all my life. All my life you have been faithful, Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. Oh, with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running. 
Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life there down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Oh my life, you have, you have, Lord. And oh my life, with every breath that I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing. Good morning, everyone. I am. Oh. Okay. There. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Phil Hamer. It's my lovely wife, Cynthia, led worship this morning. Um, I am a member of the board here. And um, yeah, every Sunday morning, one of us gets up and leads us in prayer. The focus for March has kind of been praying for the community. So I'm going to continue on with that theme. So Mike and I had a little conversation this week. And this, I think, fits in with what you're going to speak on. If not, it's a good passage anyways. So it's Jeremiah 29, verse 7. It says, But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you in exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now, hopefully none of us are in this area because they've been sent to exile. You know, if you can, we'll put your hand up. We'll pray for you. That's okay. You know, <laughs> it's not that bad of a location. We're pretty... Agriculture out here, oil and gas, <coughs> some forestry, a little bit of summer tourism with the park. But for the most part, we live out here because we want to, right? There is, you know, people in our community, you know, that sometimes they have moved out here because it's a little bit cheaper in, or a little bit cheaper living expenses, different things like that. We want to reach everybody in our community. This is a growing community. We, we've sat down, um, you know, just evaluating myself, just kind of like the people that are moving in. It's, it's great seeing people from cities coming out here. They want the little acreages. They want to live off the land. They want their hand at agriculture. Um, it kind of reminds me if you, I, I, okay, I don't know. There's this... Uh, Amazon show called Clarkson Farms, and uh, it's just this millionaire who wants to do agriculture and has all the money in the world to spend at it, but has no idea what he's doing. We don't have people like that out here, or maybe you do in your backyard, I don't know. We have people in our community we want to pray for, people in our community we want to reach, people we want to pray for their welfare, we want to pray for their health, their prosperity, their good fortune in this area. We want to build this community up. Um, we want Entrisal Community Church to kind of be a hub, a safe haven, a place where people can come and seek refuge and seek help and seek God, seek Jesus. So with that in mind, um, I just want to pray in that direction, you know, pray for the vision of the church. We are moving into a new season, which is, it's scary, but it's also exciting, you know. Um, I tried to arm wrestle Micah, 
about him staying, and I lost, so <laughs> that's all in the arm wrestle. No. Um, but we're moving into a new season, and that's exciting. We don't want to lose the vision of what God has put in us and in Entrance Community Church. So let's pray in that direction. God, we just thank you for this amazing countryside, this amazing community, Entrance Evansburg surrounding area, the Pemina Park. What a beautiful masterpiece that you've created and how you are calling people out here, that there is people moving here in droves of all ages, young and old and retirees and empty nesters to young families to young adults, God, in the work, seeking job, work in the workforce. So make us conscientious, God, of what we're seeing day in and day out as we walk the streets, as we drive around, as we go about our normal days. Make us conscientious, God, to pray for the welfare of the people in this area, to pray for the welfare of, 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 of individuals, God, that we know. And God, we just seek your guidance and your vision, God, to continue to build on what you've already planted with Entrezal Community Church. As we move into this new and exciting season, it's scary, it's, it's, it's unknown, but God, your hand is on us, your hand is on Entrezal Community Church, you are guiding us and you are directing us. So we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Edith. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, we try to have a missions moment about every month where we inform you about different things that relate to missions and things that our church supports. And so the first thing I wanted to mention is... Um, there hasn't been for a couple years, I guess, but there is going to be a missions fest in Edmonton, uh, May 5th to 7th, and that's going to be at the Church of South Edmonton, um, 9908 67th Avenue. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been, most, maybe some of you have been to missions fest before, um, but it's basically a three-day family-oriented missions conference, um, so you can just go for a day or you can go for a few days. They have keynote speakers, seminars, exhibit halls um, for the different mission organizations or camps that, you know, different ministries working in the area or around the world, children's and youth ministry as well. So if you're interested in missions, it's a great place to go. So uh, the next thing I want to mention is um, House of Omid. Uh, they are going to have a gala dinner um, and... I think you all kind of are a bit familiar with them now because they, like Ahmed and Dina, came for our missions conference. So um, this gala dinner is going to be Saturday, April 29th and in Vancouver area. Um, so it's quite a distance. So, <laughs> But anyway, like if anybody's really interested in going, they can speak to Pastor Mike about it because he's kind of handling, you know, how many can go. And there is limited space. So, you know, it's like it's not for sure that if you just want to go, you can go. Like, you'll have to just kind of make arrangements and see how, you know, what kind of space they have. So anyway, if that's something you're interested in, you can talk to him. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Lone Prairie Camp. Um, they're, like, they have summer camps, like, for kids and youth every summer. And there was a representative here about uh, a couple weeks back. I don't know if you remember Andrew. And um, anyway... Uh, he mentioned about the Adopt-A-Week, and we're going to try to do that again with our church. Hopefully, we can get people interested. Um, so that week we would like to do is August 20th to 25th, and uh, they're going to have youth camp that week. Um, so the, the vision that they want for Adopt-A-Week is to have each shareholder church, which we are one of them, adopt a week of camp by sending a number of volunteers from their congregation. So the volunteer positions that they look to fulfill each week are cooks, two or more adult volunteers, kitchen helpers who completed grade eight or older, so obviously youth can be involved in this, um, maintenance completed grade eight or older, uh, support staff completed grade nine or older. And they, um, 
they would really like to try to get as many adults out as possible because that allows them to host um, four more campers every year because if they have adult supervision, you know, that fills that requirement um, so that their staff can take breaks. Um, so uh, if you're interested, I can kind of direct you in how to apply. So you can let me know. Um, as well, uh, I just thought I'd mention, because I, I went to their AGM online yesterday, they have, they're going to have a work day June 3rd as well. So, um, you know, maybe we might be able, maybe some people here could help them with that. Um, as well as youth could be involved with that as well. And um, yeah, every year as well, they have um, Christian leadership training for young people and a staff retreat. Um, and that is like May 5th to 7th, I believe this year. So, you know, those are just things to keep in mind um, if you know young people that are interested in camp, serving in camp. So I guess that's everything. And you, know, you can just pray about maybe being involved in some of these areas, okay. And I guess I'm told as well that I'm supposed to dismiss the kids now for junior church, so age three to grade three. Um, you can go, and I will go with you. And um, yeah, have a good morning. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are continuing our series in Daniel, and Michael will be preaching that in a moment. Before that, we're just going to be reading through the scripture that he's going to be guiding us through today. So if you'd like to follow along, it'll be on screen, or you can follow in your Bibles. Uh, it is Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarus, by descent a Mede, who is made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, Daniel perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord, seeking him by prayer and pleads for mercy, by fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants of steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness, but to us open shame, as at this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them because of the treachery that they have committed against you. To us, O oh Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord God by walking in his laws which he set before us, by his servant, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that was written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heavens there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. And it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done. And we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. 
O oh Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for our, the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now, therefore, O oh our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his plea for mercy and for your own sake, O oh Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, include your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations, the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of the people of Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to the sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then, for sixty-two weeks, it shall be built again, with squares and moat, but in troubled time. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the city of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary." Its end shall come with a flood, and the end there sh and to this end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half a week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall come one who makes desolates until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Pretty intense passage for us this morning. Hey, church. Uh, my name is Micah, if I haven't met you before, and um, it's a joy to be with you this morning. We're going to be examining this passage here in Daniel, this intense passage of chapter 9. And what we've been doing as a church is we, we gather around the Word of God to hear from God what He has to teach us, what He has to reveal to us, just as the church has been doing for centuries. And this morning we're going to be hearing a passage of Scripture that's a very complicated passage, but at the same time I hope we realize the beauty of who God is in this passage. And so let us, let us get up to date with chapter 9 here. We've obviously been in Daniel a while here, and so if you're new or you're visiting and you're wondering what's going on all of a sudden, uh, what has the story of Daniel been all about? Well, the first six chapters, we read about Daniel and three friends, and they're in exile, right? And where are they in exile? Babylon, right? And so you have these Israelite Jews who are basically taken from their homeland, 
put into this foreign empire who has desolated their temple, mocked the worship of their God, tried to assimilate and integrate them into Babylonian culture, many customs which were against worship of Yahweh. And they're going through this battle, they're going through this season of life where they have to figure out how to worship and be faithful to God in a culture and context that is completely antagonistic against that worship. And so they're battling with what does it mean to assimilate into the culture, what does it mean to counteract against the culture, and the first six chapters are all about how they are shown to be faithful in the midst of that context. And and that's pretty wild just to think about just because of that. Because when we read through the Old Testament story, there's not a lot of characters who get it right, are there? (laughs) Most of the Old Testament stories are all about how people messed up and how people completely failed God and how God was exercising a covenant relationship and yet how they failed the covenant. And yet the beautiful thing we see in Daniel is Daniel is actually a, a, a good man in many instances. He's doing what is right before God. He, we see him and his friends as these figures who, who worship and don't assimilate, and who take risks for what God has called them to do, even at times risking their very lives. And and so it's quite a beautiful story just to realize who Daniel is and what has the context been. Because even though Daniel, in many instances, we read about being a, a wonderful man, following God faithfully, doing the right thing in hard circumstances, yet in this chapter... How do we see him praying? What is the mode of prayer that he's exercising? Confession. He's exercising this deep confession. He's crying out to God in these words of confession. And so we, we come before us in this passage, one of the most beautiful, beautiful prayers of Scripture. Now, where does he come to the context of this prayer? How does he come to pray like this? Well, what do we see Daniel doing at the beginning of the chapter? He's sitting there, and what is he reading? He's reading the prophet Jeremiah, right? He's reading scripture. So he's in this context later on in years. Uh, He's probably 60 years into this Babylonian exile. And he's reading the prophet Jeremiah, And he's sitting before God, and he's reading Jeremiah and says, there's supposed to be restoration after 70 years. In other words, the people of God have been exiled, 70 years is coming up, Daniel is saying, now God, finally you will restore your people and make things right again. So he's saying the 70 years that is prophesied by Jeremiah will finally come into fruition. And this is the passage that he would have been reading. Jeremiah 25. This is the explanation of why the people of God were in exile to begin with. It says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have what? Not obeyed my words. In other words, because you have not lived the way I created you to live, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, remember him? The king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against the surrounding nations. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for how long? Seventy years. Now remember, this is written before the exile. And so Daniel is saying, God promised through the prophet Jeremiah that this would happen that the Babylonians would overtake us, that we would experience exile, yet at the same time, he also promises that it would last for 70 years. Then after 70 years, I will punish the king of Babylon and the nation, bringing it to waste. And then he would go on to read this in Jeremiah 29, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. And so Daniel is sitting here, realizing that the story of God and the promises of God would be to restore his people. Now, think of this. 
If you're in Daniel's situation at this point, was the exile your fault? Any guesses? No. It had nothing to do with Daniel. What is he dealing with? He is, he is going through this exile because of the repeated failure and rebellion of his grandparents and his great-grandparents as they were unfaithful to God and broke the covenant with God. And so he's sitting in this place where he is not even the reason for exile, and yet this is how the experience you have to go through. Now, if that were you, how would you be feeling at this point in your journey? You're the one who has to experience exile, yet it was everyone else's before you whose fault it was. What kind of mentality would you have? What are some words that might describe how you're feeling at this point? It's not fair. Yeah, I'm going to blame them. It's their fault. I'm going to be bitter against them. I'm going to cry out to God and say, why am I being punished for what they have done? Right? And so this is what we expect Daniel to be saying, what Daniel to be reflecting on. And yet we see something completely different in this beautiful prayer of Daniel. And this prayer of Daniel is this posture of confession. Not just for his sins, but this posture of confession for generations upon generations who have went before him. And this posture of confession which realizes how humans are so unrighteous and yet God is so righteous. And so let's, let's look at some of just the descriptive words from this confessional prayer. How are people described in this passage? Well, we see that they are sinful. They have done wrong. They have acted wickedly. They have rebelled. They have turned aside from God's commandments and rules. They have not listened to the treachery they have committed against you. They have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. They have not walked in His laws. They have transgressed the law. They refuse to obey the voice of God. All this calamity has come upon them because they have not entreated the favor of God. They have not turned from their iniquities. They have not gained insight from the truth of God. That's the description of humanity right there. That's the description of why they were in exile. Now, again, this description and this confession of Daniel is even more powerful when we reflect on the person that he is. Because he represented the best of Israel. He himself was a godly man. And yet in his prayers, he is not above going to the depths of mourning, even sackcloth and ashes this morning, and even counting himself among those who have dishonored God. This generational confession. Now, I find this absolutely fascinating reading this section of Scripture. Uh, because often when I teach church history, every semester I have to go through periods of history in the church that are quite horrific when we think about them. And one of the major periods I have to cover is the Crusades. And the question that gets repeatedly asked year after year is, how do we, Micah, take ownership over the Crusades when we had nothing to do with them? Right? Right? And even a more modern question is, with the conversation surrounding the residential schools, how do we as the church today talk about the residential schools when we had nothing to do with them? And I look to this passage in Daniel, and it gives us some wisdom, does it not? It tells us and reveals to us that even though there has been generational sins that have gone before us, that perhaps we have nothing to do with, we still bear that responsibility to practice corporate confession. And we still bear that responsibility before God in crying out and mourning over the evil and injustice that has even been done in the lives of the people of God. And so this corporate confession gives us this beautiful example of what that looks like. And it reminds us of who we truly are as people, as humans, those who have rebelled against their creator. 
And yet here's, here's the beautiful thing of the prayer, is it's not just left with humanity as desolate. There's a hope there. And so what are the, some of the descriptions of God in this passage? If you, if you know some, just yell them out. What are some things that you're reading? What are some of the descriptions of God in this passage? He is faithful. He is compassionate. He is forgiving. He is righteous. That's a key one. We're going to deep dive into that one. He keeps his covenant. He keeps his steadfast love. He is merciful and forgiving. He rescued the people out of Egypt. He's a rescuer. He's a deliverer. He is merciful. He hears. He forgives. He acts in his righteousness. And so we compare these two contrasts in the prayer where we see the, the depths of depravity of humanity and yet we see the beauty of the character of who God is. And one of the, the major emphasis of Daniel's prayer for God's character, he repeats it over and over and over again, he repeats it four times, is that God is righteous. God is righteous. Now, I brought up this quote a lot. Um, my Old Testament, one of my Old Testament scholars, that's probably my favorite guy named Bruce Walke. He has a, a description that I think is one of the most simple yet most profound descriptions of righteousness in the Old Testament. And I quote it a lot. I'm going to test you who remembers some of it. What is a definition of a righteous person? Someone who is willing to... Yeah, you're close, Dorothy, right? Someone who is willing to disadvantage themselves for the advantage of others. Okay? A righteous person is someone who is willing to disadvantage themselves for the advantage of others. Where a wicked person on the opposite would be someone who is willing to disadvantage others to advantage themselves, right? Right? This is the concept of righteous in the Old Testament. This is the depths of what it means. And so righteous is not just about this private morality. Righteousness in the Old Testament is, is deeply relational. It's connected to community. It's connected to relationship. Righteousness is all about how you treat other people. And so think about this. How would we be righteous in our marriage? What would a righteous person look like in their marriage? Yeah, they would seek the needs of their spouse before their own. This is good prep for you guys as you're preparing for marriage. <laughs> How do you show righteousness in marriage? Yeah, you, you celebrate the other. Yeah, there's this listening, there's a respect. Hopefully a faithfulness. That's pretty key for a healthy marriage. Amen. Right? Yeah, you practice forgiveness. You practice mercy. You seek restoration. Right? What, what about how do you show righteousness in your parenting? How would you be a righteous parent? Yeah, admit when you're wrong. You have this humility before your children. Yeah, discipline. That's a key one, right? What does it mean to discipline your kids? You, you exercise as a judge more often than you realize as a parent, right? How else do you show righteousness in parenting? Yeah, you sacrifice for your kids. Is, is parenting not sacrifice? My goodness, it is sacrifice. You sacrifice for your kids. <laughs> Maybe I said that too boldly. <laughs> yeah, okay, a little too bold. I love my daughters. Just to clarify, let's hold that back. <laughs> what about in your work? How do you show righteousness in your work? What did your work relationship look like? Integrity. Doing what you say you're going to do.
Yeah, exactly. Taking care of your coworkers. Yeah. Taking, if you're a boss, taking care of your workers. Pardon? Yeah, putting in honest hours, right? This integrity. And so righteousness, again, is, is relational. It's deeply connected to community. And we realize, especially as we read the Old Testament, but even in Daniel, Daniel has been a picture of, again, as we looked at in chapter 7 and chapter 8, of how humans and human kingdoms and human empires are full of evil and injustice and unrighteousness where we as humans, we constantly mistreat each other, don't we? We even mistreat the people we love at times, don't we? There's a deep unrighteousness with humanity. And yet what we read here is that God is righteous. Now, Daniel 9 here frames God as this righteous God, and specifically he defines God and his righteousness first and foremost as God as a judge. Again, chapter 7 of Daniel was God's judgment on the nations, that all these evil and unjust nations would experience God's judgment because evil needs to be eradicated. And so we see this, this glimpse of God's righteousness as judge. Now, here's another question. How do you show righteousness as a judge now? Would it be just to forgive everyone? Or would it to be exercise punishment for wrongdoings? Interesting question, is it? How do you exercise righteousness as a judge? Now, God sees this, this judgment of God for exile is actually based on the righteousness of God because he sees that there needs to be a serious consequence on evil and destructive behavior and that the judge needs to be just and righteous. And so that's why Daniel can, can pray this prayer when he sees Jerusalem des, uh, destroyed, when he sees the people in exile, he realized that it's actually because of the righteousness of God. And he says it wouldn't be good of God, it wouldn't be right of God to allow this evil and injustice and wickedness to continue throughout the world. So, the, so God is acting just in his righteousness. Do you guys get that? You catching on to that? It's key. That's the only way Daniel can praise God in the midst of this. But here's the other wild thing about God's righteousness then. Is God's righteousness doesn't just bring him to exercise judgment and justice. And here's where God is so beautiful because not as only God a righteous judge who is working against evil and injustice... But God's righteousness is also leading him towards forgiveness and restoration. Amen? That's the best news we could ever hear. See, like we read about God's righteousness as a judge, but at the same time in Daniel's prayer, we read about how God is merciful and forgiving. And God's righteousness compels him to bring justice but God's righteousness also compels him to forgive and restore. Isn't that a wild concept? Can any human accomplish that? None of us can. It is God alone who can accomplish that. It is God alone who has that characteristic. It is God alone who can exercise perfect righteousness. And we see it in this beautiful contrast between his, his justice and his mercy. And the fullness of God's righteousness is revealed in both of that. And so we see then in God's righteousness, going back to Bruce Walke's idea of righteousness, right? God is willing to disadvantage himself for the advantage of humans. And this is how he leads to forgiveness and restoration because where does God's justice ultimately display itself upon himself? At the cross, right? Where God's demand for justice, God's demand for evil and injustice to be eradicated is found upon God taking the justice of himself upon himself. It's a wild concept. And that is the only way 
that forgiveness and restoration can occur. That is good news, amen, church? That is the best news we could ever fathom. That is the wild description of a God who loves his creation. And I think one of the beautiful thought is, I got this idea from Tim Keller, but he, he said, we are more sinful than we could ever imagine. And yet we are more loved than we could ever comprehend. And a God who is righteous, who can exercise judgment and justice against all that is wrong in the world, and yet that same righteousness will forgive and restore the wickedness of people, is the most beautiful news we could ever have of a God who loves us. And this is why this, this passage is one of my favorite in the New Testament. To me, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful summary of so much of the Old Testament story says, if we confess our sins, and what's Daniel doing here? Chapter 9 is just deep, deep confession. If we confess our sins, God is faithful. In other words, he is faithful to his people. He's faithful to his character. But here's the beautiful aspect that we often forget about. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. In other words, Forgiveness, God's faithfulness to his character, to his holiness, demands justice. And yet God took that justice upon himself on the cross of Jesus Christ so that we could be forgiven and restored in relationship to him. Which now means that God would be unjust not to forgive us when we come in confession of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's a wild thing to think about too. That because of what Jesus has done on our behalf to take upon the justice of God, God would now be unjust, going against his very character when we come before him in confession and repentance. And it's not just that either. There's another step. There's this other beautiful reality that we get to experience as the people of God. He forgives us of our sins, and he also does something else. He cleanses us from all what? All our unrighteousness. He cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. And again, the whole story of Daniel, the whole story of the Old Testament, how unrighteous people are, how people take advantage of one another, how people slander one another, how people abuse one another, how people ridicule one another, how people steal from one another, how people enslave one another, right? All that unrighteousness. God cleanses us from and he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can receive the righteousness of God. Which means that we now have the power to be the people that God has created us to be and be the people in relationship that we are called to be. Amen, church? This is wild stuff in this prayer. This is so powerful. I want to camp out in that forever, but there's still a lot to deal with in this passage. I haven't even got to the very controversial part yet, so we'll get there. (laughs) And so as Daniel is praying, as he's confessing before God, as he's reminding himself of the righteous character of God, he's reminding himself that what was promised through the prophet Jeremiah of God's forgiveness and restoration of his people, this has to come true. God, I'm waiting for it to happen. When is it going to happen? And this is the response that we see from the messenger, the angel Gabriel, to Daniel. And he tells them, he says, O Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you. And this is the first thing that Daniel is told. For you are what? Greatly loved. For you are greatly loved. And so Daniel's in this place, in this position, where he's been what? He's been kidnapped. He's been taken into exile. He's been enslaved for a period of time. He's been castrated, if you remember that part which means any hope for a future, any hope for a family is what? 
God. I mean, that's pretty easy science for us to understand, right? He's lived under oppression. He's been betrayed by his co-workers who literally tried to put him to death. He's lived in danger. He survived several regime changes where, again, his life was threatened. If you're going through Daniel's life right now, are you going to think you are loved by God? You're going to be crying out and saying, God, why did you allow all these horrific, horrible things to happen to me? God, why am I paying for the penalty of the sins of generations that came before me? Why is all this happening? And yet, there's this deep reminder that he is loved. And I think that's an interesting thing for us to fathom in our relationship with God is that a life of ease isn't indicative of God's love for us. Anyone else experience that? God will allow hard, difficult circumstances to come upon us, to reveal things about himself, and to reveal things about ourselves that ultimately remind us and reveal the depth of the love that he has for us. And, and so this, this is this beautiful description of a, a reminder, first and foremost, of God. He says that you are loved. Now, the obvious answer, I mean, Gabriel could have easily just come in and said, okay, let's talk about the prophet Jeremiah, let's talk about the prophecy, let's talk about why this hasn't come into fruition yet, but first and foremost, he reminds Daniel that he is loved, greatly loved. That's the foundation. And, and I, I think this is such a foundation for us, too, because we have to realize that, that if we want better confession in our life, and I know we all struggle with practicing confession. Anyone here want to confess right now? Who, who struggles with confession in their life? Right? We're struggling to confess it even now. That's okay. We struggle with confession be, because it, it's hard for us to come to terms with the ways that we have failed God, the ways that we have failed others, the way we've even failed ourselves, it's hard to come to terms with that. But when we understand, first and foremost, that we are greatly loved, it helps us move forward in confession. And I, I truly believe that some of the reasons we struggle with confession is because we don't see God for who he truly is. We don't see him as a loving God. And, and, and Paul even tells us this straight up. He, he says it's actually the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And, and I think we could say it's the love of God that can lead us to confession. Because when we know that we are loved by God and we know that the love of God isn't going to be risked by our failures and our flaws and our mistakes, then we can bring him before God so that we can experience his forgiveness and his restoration. But when we don't practice confession, we don't get to experience the depths of God's forgiveness. We don't get to experience the depth of God's restoration. We lose out on so much of what God has for us. And so when Daniel sees the beauty of God's righteous character, he can go straight into confession. And so here's my conviction. I truly believe that confessional worship... This practice confession, both individually and corporate confession and confession of sins in the past not even made by us, is designed to create in us this intersection of the heart where we get a depth of understanding of the intersection of God's character even where grief and sorrow over our sin intersect with the celebration of the forgiveness and grace of God. Just as God's character of justice and mercy interact in his righteousness, our practice of confession of sorrow over grief and sin can interact with experience of forgiveness and grace of God. Amen, church? There's such a beauty, a beauty in confessional worship. It's so crucial for us. And Daniel, to me, gives us one of the most beautiful examples of that prayer. Okay, let's, let's keep going. I, I want to stop here. 
but we're going to keep going. And we're going to get into the wild part of Daniel. And so this is sort of like a detached, it's, it's sort of connected, but it's, this is the wild passage of Daniel. Um, we, we come to verse 24 now. And when we look at Daniel 9, especially verse 24, um, many scholars have actually called this the most difficult passage to interpret in all the Old Testament. Okay? Just to give you some headway of where we're at in this section of Scripture. And the, the difficulty really comes in the interpretive challenge. And how do we understand this? But, but let, me, let me give you a basic view. And I really want to emphasize the main points to make sure we don't get distracted here. But this, again, is the answer to Daniel's question of, I'm reading Jeremiah, God. It says that you're going to restore your people after 70 years. It's coming up on 70 years. What is going on? Are you actually going to do it? And this is the answer he gets in regards to that question. He said, the, the, the messenger, Gabriel, says this to them. He says, 70 weeks. Okay? Now, here already we have a massive interpretive challenge. Because in Jewish culture and custom, a week would refer to, does anyone know? Seven years, right? So that's why some of you will have uh, an interpretation that goes 70 times seven years, right? Where a week would be referenced that. So basically, 70 times seven. Now, I use ESV, which is a little more literal translation, so you have to do extra translation work to understand it, but I'm telling you guys, okay? So 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Now, think about this for a second. Even if the prophecy of Dan or Jeremiah were to come into fruition... And people restored to Jerusalem and restored to the temple worship and restored to everything that they had been practicing as Israelites before. Would any of that come true even if they returned to their old practices? No, none of it. There would still be transgression. There would still be sin. The end of sin would not come to an end. There wouldn't be a final atonement. There wouldn't be an everlasting righteousness among the people. And so already we're, we're getting a glimpse that God has something greater in mind for humans than just the Israelite practice of worship. Okay? And so what God is telling us is, is he's sitting there, Daniel is sitting there asking for God to reveal him about these 70 years of Jeremiah. And what God responds to him is, guess what? You need to look much further. And you need to expect things much grander than just a restoration of your people. And, and he's bringing this to the description of something that's so beyond anything Daniel could ever fathom. And so even if we do the math in our head, and I, I don't know if, if if you're new to the church and you don't know much about church history, there's been some strange things in the last 200 years where pe people will put all these charts together and try to do timelines with Daniel and figure out the return of Jesus and all these things. And you know what? There, there's not really a place for that in this passage. Because 70 times 7 is how many years? Four, you guys are good at math already. I'm impressed, right? <laughs> 490 years, right? And, and again, when, when we look at Hebrew scripture, even the language of, of seven, seven is symbolic, and what does it mean? It's this perfection, it's this wholeness, similar to like a seven-week pattern, it's a whole week. And so there's this description, there's this language of coming into fruition, coming into fullness, coming into completion. And so there's this expectation that one day these things will come into fruition, come into completion, where the transgressions will be ended. The sin will be dealt with. Iniquity will be atoned for. There will be an everlasting righteousness. 
But it's far greater than the vision of Jeremiah and even the vision of Daniel. And so Daniel 9 tells us this brokenness of sin of Israel runs so deep that just the exile, the Babylon, didn't actually deal with the heart of the problem and it's only the righteousness of God that can deal with the evil and injustice of this world and it's only the righteousness of God, as we talked about, that can forgive and restore humanity. And so Daniel 9 is this expectation that something is yet to happen in the future where God's judges, justice and mercy and where his righteousness will meet perfectly and deal with evil. Where do we find that in history, church? The cross of Jesus Christ. The crucifixion. Where the justice of God and the mercy of God come together. And, and as complex as this section of Scripture is, the early church fathers who began to write commentaries and write, and there's about 11 of them that write specifically on Daniel. People like Irenaeus and Tertullian and Hippopolis, Origen, Eusebius. A lot of these church fathers dealt with Daniel 9. And consistently, they all bring to the reality that this is a messianic passage. It's about Jesus the Messiah. And that this has to do everything with Jesus. And, and so it seems here that in, in this veiled form, God was showing Daniel and God was telling his people all these things that were anticipated and expected in the work of Jesus. And that it's the work of Jesus on the cross that actually finishes the transgression and puts an end to sin. And it's his death that atones for iniquity and brings in everlasting righteousness for his people. And so this passage of Scripture is this beautiful prophecy. It's this beautiful expectation of who Jesus would be and what Jesus would accomplish. And so think of this. I mean, even the language of this passage, uh, to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal, in other words, to vindicate the vision and the prophet of Daniel, to anoint the most holy place where not just the temple, but Jesus was the temple. The anointed one shall be cut off just as Jesus was abandoned and cut off from his father, and they shall be established in the land. I mean, this is, this is wild to think about how the story of Jesus fulfills all of these expectations. And the story of history goes on to show us that God would accomplish all of this in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In the cross. Where the cross is this moment in history where all the evil and injustice of humanity gets completely exposed. And yet it's also this beautiful description of the greatest forgiveness and restoration that has ever been offered to humanity. And the only hope that we have and the only hope for all these evil kingdoms and empires that we've talked about through Daniel is that God is righteous in his character. And he will call out what is wrong with us as humans and he will deal with our evil and injustice in a way that doesn't destroy us as humanity but actually saves us. It's wild to think about. And this is... This is such good news. Because what this means and what this tells us is that God names and deals with our evil and he absorbs it upon himself dealing with his justice so that we can receive the gift as his forgiveness and restoration. That's the beauty of the cross. And, and the cross I picked was a, a Celtic cross because we just celebrated St. Patrick's Day. Right? I see a few of you are wearing green. I wore green just to be late to the party. <laughs> but you know what? It's fascinating to me, uh, even, even the life of St. Patrick. Uh, because St. Patrick actually had a very similar life to Daniel. I mean, St. Patrick was kidnapped. He was enslaved. 
he had to live his life in a foreign land with very barbaric culture. I mean, when we talk about the monsters' kingdoms in Daniel 7, I mean, that is the context and culture he was living in. And yet, he took the wisdom of Jeremiah just as Daniel did. And he sought to bless, just as Phil reminded us in Jeremiah 29 this morning. That he he sought to bless, and he sought to love, and he didn't fully assimilate, and yet he was able to put himself in a posture that completely changed a nation with the gospel with the good news, telling the wonderful message that God's judgment and justice is upon you because of the evil, wicked acts you have done as a nation. And yet at the same time, because of his righteousness, the opportunity for forgiveness, the opportunity for restoration is right before you. And he truly changed a nation, didn't he? One of the greatest missionaries the church has ever known. Why? Because he realized, just like the posture of Daniel, that we don't assimilate, but we don't abandon. We impact and we influence as righteous, faithful followers of Jesus who have experienced the beautiful righteousness of God, who restores us and forgives us and exercises judgment against our sin that we could never repay ourselves. That is the good news of Daniel 9. That is the good news that the church has known throughout centuries. That is the good news that we celebrate on St. Patrick Day, even in his life. And that is the good news for each and every one of us today. Amen? Let's pray to that extent. Gracious God, we come before you. And Lord, especially after reading a passage like this, we first and foremost have to come in confession. Lord, we are a people who are not what we should be. Our sin is more profound than we could ever imagine. We have acted with iniquity. We have exercised unrighteousness against our family, friends, co-workers, strangers, in so many ways that we could never fathom. And yet at the same time, You also give us an opportunity to be restored. You give us an opportunity to experience your forgiveness. And that is all because you are a righteous God. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us this morning that we would come to you in a deep confession. That we would realize our deep need for you to restore us, to make us whole, to make us into fully what you created us to be. And we also pray that we would just come before you constantly in confession so that we can experience the depth of your forgiveness and mercy. Lord, we know that we are more sinful than we could ever imagine, and yet we are more loved than we could ever, we could ever dream, we could ever hope for. And so I pray that in the midst of of our lives, that we would hear first and foremost the words of God through his messenger Gabriel, that you are greatly loved. And knowing we are loved would draw us even closer in relationship to you and draw us into even deeper confession where we can experience the beauty of your mercy and your forgiveness. We thank you for this prayer. We thank you that you are a God who makes all things right. We, are, we thank you for the crucifixion of Jesus where we see your justice and your mercy in full display. And we know there is salvation found only there. And so we pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know that salvation, who doesn't know the grace and mercy and forgiveness that you have for them, who doesn't know that they don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore because you have dealt with your, their sins on the cross. I pray that they would come to you and find you and know that you are good and know that you love them. We thank you, gracious God, for that gift. Amen. Amen. Okay.
guys can stand if you'd like. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is Shadows burn like a fire, and I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. Or I speak, Jesus. We need to sing that again. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. And over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression. Or we speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus shout Jesus from the mountain and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. We're gonna shout, shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Because your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break gave you stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence I speak
and her earth is quick before it. Moved by the sound of his voice, sees that a shaking and stay can be calmed and broken for my real girl. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, in his way. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is way.
gracious God, we come before you, praying that it is well. And Lord, we look to Daniel, crying out to you, and yet coming to the realization that all his expectations of your restoration wouldn't come into fruition the way he expected, the way he wanted, the way he thought. And yet your vision and your mission and your purpose for forgiveness and restoration to deal with the sins of humanity, to finally reconcile that relationship and to make all things right would come in your plans and your timing. And Lord, we sit here before you this morning as well. And we look at our circumstances and we look at hardships and we look at pain in our life. We look at suffering. And we ask you the same way Daniel asked. Lord, when are you going to make things right? How long does humanity have to go through injustice and evil and wickedness? How long, O Lord, till you renew all things? And yet we can say it is well because we know that you are good. We know that you are righteous. And we know that you are working all things together for your glory and for our good. And so I pray that we would just sit and trust knowing in who you are and what you are accomplishing. We thank you, gracious God, for that gift. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you guys to sit for a second. We got one more announcement before we leave today. And uh, this announcement is just seeing how God um, brings restoration in the lives of, of young men. And so we're going to watch a quick video on an organization we love and support. Good morning, church. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Marie Bayless. Um, I'm also known as the Hat Lady. And today I'm wearing my Rock Solid hat because I'm an ambassador for Rock Solid Refuge. And um, most of you know this story, but I'm going to give a little background because there's a lot of new people here. But uh, about a year and a half ago, I went to Stony Plain to visit my youngest daughter, Lisa. 
And on the lawn, my 16-year-old grandson, an only child um, from a single mom, was sitting on the lawn, absolutely stoned out of his mind. This is a boy who's an only child, so he is a gamer, anorexic. He had now dropped out of school, and he was suicidal. He had lost all hope. Our whole family were in despair, and we didn't know what to do, but we knew we had to do something now. Um, in Scotland, I'd worked with Teen Challenge, so my go-to was, well, I'll go and contact Teen Challenge. I was shocked when I found out that Teen Challenge does not take teens. <laughs> and the reason they don't, they didn't in Scotland either, and I never could figure out why. And the reason they don't is because no one is willing to take on a troubled teen guardianship. And I kind of get that, but they lost the plot, I think. <laughs> uh, so we were in desperation. What can we do for Hunter? What can we do? Because this, this required an intervention. The Lord prepared the path before us, and Lisa was working with a fellow who, when he heard Hunter's plight, had been to rock solid, had gone through the program, and after, he interned there and worked for another couple of years. And so he made us aware of Rock Solid. And wow, I mean, to, to me that was a miracle because later on I found out that um, there is not uh, another Christian-based facility like this at all that's taking troubled boys from the age of 13 to 18 with behavior problems, substance abuse problems, all kinds of problems, really. And so we got in touch with them, and Hunter had to be willing to go. So that was a hard one to pull off, but the Lord, again, he answers prayers. I'm a big fan of prayer, because <laughs> when all else fails, I pray. Well, actually, that's not true. I used to do it that way. Now I do it the other way around and save myself a whole lot of grief. I just pray. <laughs> so um, they said, they accepted Hunter, and they said the earliest they could get him in was January. We knew that would be too late. So, again, I have really sore knees, and a lot of it is I'm praying a lot. This time, prayer, tears, prayer, tears, calling prayer lines, calling everyone. I know. Tuesday, the following week, we got a phone call and said, if you can have Hunter in here the following Tuesday, he's in. Somebody had done a runner. Um, we prayed for that boy. He came back. But after Hunter was in the program. So Hunter went in the program, and um, he did not engage. He was in withdrawal, and because uh, he was on other things as well, I'm sure. And uh, he laid in his bed, curled up in a ball, facing the wall, and would not eat, would not talk to anybody. Uh, was in pretty rough shape. And eventually, um, we're getting, all he could think about was, i got to get out of here. But that's how they all think. They think they're in prison. And they all got, the goal is to get out. And so um, Hunter knew that he was going to get a break at Christmas and go to uh, come home. And he thought this is his opportunity. They told him to his face, we'll give you to December 30th to come back. If not, your place has gone to, to many other needy kids. A miracle happened again, and although Hunter didn't really want to go, um, the Lord intervened, and he put it on his heart, and Hunter went. Okay, so that's the background of the story. And is there a picture up there of Hunter? There's, I think it's on the screen there. But anyway, um, so Hunter basically lost those first three months. He was there in October. He goes back in December, and Hunter's very goal-oriented. 
and they put goals before him, and he had a lot of really hard goals. He had all kinds of counseling and workbooks and everything under the sun to do. And he just decided to engage just like that. And he's the first kid ever to complete all the things they put before him. They couldn't even find more things. Um, but he completed it two months early. So that's him graduating two months before he was supposed to. The only problem is he was missing all the fun stuff, like family camp and all the reward stuff. So he comes home, and unfortunately when he came home, his mother had just gotten a, a job in British Columbia and was away from home. So he came home to an empty home, basically, like she was there on and off. Again, back into the old routine, he had a really difficult time transitioning. Please, if you're a prayer, pray for Hunter. He's, he's clean, he's working, he's working in Victoria right this week, and he's getting money to take his driver's training, and um, yeah, that, that it's an ongoing story, but it's all good, and it's hard for him, and but it, it's, it's amazing. So, uh, I'm basically here, I'm supposed to be giving an update on Rock Solid. So, Rock Solid is a standalone place. So, they raise all their own funds. They have worked very hard for a number of years, for about 10, and they have, uh, they're able to take, they have facilities, staff, and accommodation for between seven to eight boys. And they're full to the brim right now with 78 boys. But what they uh, accomplished this year is somebody donated a barn. So they moved the barn. This is all pretty expensive stuff. They moved the barn, and they now have a barn for their uh, horse program, which was very badly needed. They um, spent the summer building a foundation and making it uh, like a second story to a house, a usable uh, space, and somebody had donated a bylev or um, a duplex or something like that. Anyway, they they got that moved, which was very expensive because they had to move several power lines <laughs> to get the house on. So that's up and running. They have all the staff except for key workers which are youth workers. They've got the teachers, they've got the, just everybody's there ready to go to take seven to eight more kids for a total of 14. Now there's a waiting list from all over Canada because there's just nobody else faith-based to do this. So I fi figured that they really accomplished a lot in a very short time. So as I became ambassador, getting back to the story of Hunter, um, in March, I, I don't know what came over me. I must have been crazy because it was hard. I decided to make the nine-hour journey. And I thought, oh, I don't want to go empty. So the week before, I said to the church, I said, can you guys bake some cookies or something and I'll take down? Well... I was overwhelmed because I had a truck full. I have a half-ton truck, and I had blue tubbies, and they were all full. There was no more room in my truck. I had so much baking. It was so incredible. I had people come up secretly. They wanted it to be secret, and they handed me money. And so we named the truck the Antwistle Community Church Blessing Truck. And we got down to rock solid, uh, and in one of the worst snowstorms the day before, there was no snow all the way down except at rock solid, and they were, um, what do you call it, surfing, no, skiing, you know, boarding over the fences. <laughs> so I'm glad I was in my truck. So anyway... Um, we blessed them with a truckload of cookies and stuff that they were overwhelmed with. Um, $1,020.50 out of nowhere, out of a church. Look at this board over here sometime, people. You are a giving, generous, kind church. 
This was over and above what you guys already do. And, uh, and every boy got a, a gift bag, and they, you know, it was all really cool stuff for them that they, you know, little comfort, creature comforts. So um, I'm here to make the appeal again. Only this time, I know there's people kind of like me that are a bit rubbish at baking. <laughs> and so we're making the plea for baked goods, apples, oranges. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Ramen noodles, R-A-M-E-N. Ramen <laughs> noodles, <laughs> obviously I don't know. And uh, popcorn, coffee. And for you men out there, they, the, the carpentry, they're into doing, the boys are doing carpentry, they need hammers, they need measuring tapes. And on their dream list, they would love, a, you know, um, battery operated power drills. So anyway, um, I have set up a table at the front door. Some of you pr probably noticed when I came in. There's a few items on there, but please have a look at it if you're interested. If you're just wanting to pray, that is the most powerful thing. Please pray over this incredible ministry. And uh, I have to have everything at the church by next Sunday. Now here's, here's the Hunter story. So Hunter has a friend, his name is Shram, and he, he went through the program kind of halfway through when Hunter did, and they just hit it off. Hunter, Hunter or Shram lives in Vancouver. Shram is flying in the following Wednesday night, staying with Hunter. I'm picking them all up at like five in the morning, and we're trying to make it for supper at Rock Solid. And then the next day, we've all been asked to speak at Swift Current in a church there. So there's lots of reasons to pray. <laughs> so uh, that's my appeal. Sorry I kept you so long, but um, I, I'm proud of you guys and uh, proud to belong to this incredible church. Thanks, Marie, for sharing stories of restoration and stories of generosity, and it's beautiful to be part of you all to experience that and practice that together. Well, I love you all. I pray that you would go with a deep understanding of God's righteousness, but not just an understanding and enjoyment of God's righteousness. So God bless you all. Love you all. <laughs>